Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'll be there in a minute. My sister in the sound booth, don't get nervous. I'm going to say some things that ain't there yet, okay? So uh, appreciate everybody being here. I know what's going to happen this week. I think it's is Tuesday or Wednesday, Valentine's Day. It's not a biblical holiday. Let me say it again. It's not a biblical holiday. Every day we should love one another. Amen. When I was a young boy in elementary school, we had a, I came from a small school. We had like 25, 30 kids in class. Now, the truth of the matter is those 25, 30 kids of us in first grade graduated high school together. So we went all the way through school, and then we ended up in a high school with a bunch of other junior highs coming in. And uh, it's actually a 2A state champ of basketball when I was there. But when I was a young boy, I'm talking like second, third grade, this hit me last night while I was trying to go to sleep. We would, uh, everybody in the class got a Valentine. You, you brought 25, 30, remember, Kenny? You brought 25 or 30 little Valentine cards for everybody in the class. And you went home with 25 or 30 Valentine cards because everybody in the class gave you one. But now, if you happen to get a card from one of them that had perhaps, uh, they put some of them little sweeties in there, them little hearts with the little words on them, you know. If you got a little box of that that came with yours and all of a sudden you looked and seen what young lady sent you that. Now, it was on like Donkey Kong when you was in the third grade because you're going to find out who, who's in that, especially if you're the only one she sent the sweethearts to. Amen. If she gave everybody sweet. Well, it didn't matter. But if you're the one that got the little, and I forget what them little things were called, little heart shape. Is that conversation, whatever? Uh, I, don't, I never knew. I just knew they tasted nasty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They weren't like sweet tarts. So anyway, I remember doing that when we were young. We would pass them cards around. You know, and here you'd come up as a, a young man, a young lady, and you're trying to figure things out in life. And, and, and I can tell you that men both that I know of are basically never depressed. I'm going to tell you why. They're just happy people, men are, that I know. You know, what do you expect from such a simple creature? <laughs> Your last name stays put. The garage is all yours. Wedding plans take care of themselves. Chocolate is just another snack. You can never be pregnant. Car mechanics tell you the truth. The world is your urinal. <laughs> you never have to drive to another gas station restroom because... This one is just too icky. <laughs> you don't have to stop and think of which way to turn a nut or a bolt. Wrinkles add character. Wedding dresses are five grand. Tux rentals a hundred bucks. New shoes don't cut, blister, or mangle your feet. You got one mood all the time. Phone conversations are over in 30 seconds flat. A five-day vacation requires only one suitcase. You can open all your own jars. You get extra credit for the slightest act of thoughtfulness. <laughs> if someone forgets to invite you, he or she can still be your friend. <laughs> Think on that one a minute. <laughs> your underwear is $9.95 for a three-pack. You almost never have strap problems in public. You're unable to see wrinkles in your clothes. Before I walked out of here, they were taking them hair getter offers all, and running all over my vest. You know, I, I never noticed it. <laughs> the same hairstyle lasts for years. <laughs> Miss Susan cut my hair. She said, how you want it? I said, just like it was in the seventh grade. <laughs> uh, you, they, you only have to shave your face and neck. You can play with toys all your life. You can do your nails with your pocket knife. You have freedom of choice concerning growing a mustache. <laughs> you can do Christmas shopping for 25 relatives on December the 24th in 25 minutes. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, no wonder men are happy. There are, there's a difference in men and women. You know that, don't you? It's just a big difference. I'm going to get you laughing now because you're going to have to cry a little bit in a little <laughs> while. But I want you to laugh now. Listen, men and women, this is a difference. I think this may be there. Uh, bathrooms. A man has six items in his bathroom. Toothbrush, toothpaste, shaving cream, razor, 
bar of soap, and a towel. The average number of items in a typical women's bathroom is 337. A man would not be able to identify more than 20 of these items. Arguments. A woman has the last word in any argument. Anything a man says after that is the beginning of a new argument. <laughs> future. A woman worries about the future until she gets a husband. A man never worries about the future until he gets a wife. Amen. I didn't say it was going to be easy. Success. A successful man is one who makes more money than his wife can spend. A successful woman is one who can find such a man. <laughs> Marriage. A woman marries a man expecting he will change, but he doesn't. A man marries a woman expecting that she won't change, but she does. <laughs> Natural. Men wake up as good looking as they went to bed. Women somehow deteriorate during the night. <laughs> Offspring. Children. 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 A woman knows all about her children. She knows about dentist appointments, romances, best friend, favorite foods, secret fears, hopes, and dreams. A man is vaguely aware of some short people living in the house. <laughs> Thought for the day. A married man should forget his mistakes. There's no use in two people remembering the same thing. <laughs> All you ladies still love me. I just had to get you laughing a little bit. You know, again, as we move in toward this week, before I knew how much God loved me, I had my own idea of love. I thought this was love, and, you know, I, I remember, uh, you know, taking a little matchbox and putting a little chain in it and a couple of sweet tarts and giving it to a young lady thinking I was in love in the, in the fifth grade. And, you know, you just had these ideas. But when I got born again, I found out the definition of love. I didn't understand it. So this is a whole different thing uh, for me to move into. But the word is koinonia in the scripture. It means fellowship or choice fellowship. It's what goes on in this church whenever we have particular meetings, that koinonia. It's a particular time. And this is a word that affected the New Testament church. It's that which is in common, communion, sharing, a social, uh, not to be uniquely yoked. Amen. Unequally yoked, excuse me, in marriage, business, society, because it is incompatible with the fellowship with the Father. When I got born again, I actually did change my playmates. The people I used to run with, I couldn't run with no more. Now, most of the playmates got born again after I did, and we became close friends again. But it was now basis on Christ, and that's where everything stood in our lives. So I had to be careful with my fellowship and who I hung out with, because koinonia is so important to me. When I, get, when I go to a football game, I, I, I cheer with others for the team that we're for, but there's a koinonia that brought us together. Amen. And there's a relationship with Jesus. Koinonia is that heavenly love which fills the heart of the believer, one for another, for God. In other words, when you got saved, all of a sudden you found a whole new family. You found a whole new fellowship. Amen. You found connections with brothers and sisters. You found somebody that would go from East Tennessee and go and pick up your boy and take him to Virginia. That all has to do with koinonia. The book of Corinthians, Paul is speaking in chapter 8, 2 Corinthians, and he's talking about one of the churches that he planted there. And he said, now, friends, I want to report on this surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in the Macedonia province. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy. Let me say it again. The trials exposed them. And they were incredibly happy. A lot of folk, when you go through trials, it exposes who we are. And for these people, they still had joy. Through desperate, though desperately poor, the pressure triggered something totally unexpected. An outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there. I saw it for myself. They gave offerings or whatever they could, far more than they could afford, pleading with the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. In other words, they wanted to be involved. And this was that koinonia that drove us. And it drives this house and the people here. So many times we've done uh, food banks and, and clothing. We've gone downtown. Maria, I remember going down and delivering uh, blankets and, and, and purses and whatever we could to the homeless shelter. That's koinonia. It's the thing that pushes us and drives us. And this is what Paul's talking about here. Amen. He said, this was total spontaneous, entirely their own idea, and caught us completely off guard. What explains it 
it was that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. The other giving simply flowed out of the purpose of God working in their lives. It's amazing what happens to us when we see a need, when we go through, you know, for us that have gone through the floods and the hurricanes, it affects us when other people do it. And that koinonia, it, it forces us. It's spontaneous. We just got to help somebody. We got to do something for them. Now, as we move into this love time this week, we understand the word is romance. Mm. Mm. See, romance has nothing to do with koinonia. It has nothing to do with that choice fellowship. In other words, romance, my friend, listen to this, is a fictitious tale of wonderful and extraordinary events. Did he say fictitious? Yes, he did. Characterized by much imagination and idealization, without basis in fact and exaggeration or falsehood. Boy, did that just pop some balloons. Amen. Romance. Because we're always talking about, we've been brought up in this romantic society of America that this week would be that, that. And what happens to a lot of people, particularly singles, they feel the pressure of, this, of that day. And, and, and marriages that aren't really solid, you feel the pressures of that day. Folk that have been uh, through hard relationship, it's pressure. And I want to take that pressure off of you. I want to tell you that God give, gave all of us a different definition of love. Amen. That word love in the Vines Dictionary says, whether exercised toward the brethren or toward people generally is not an impulse from the feelings. You know, I can love you without feeling it. Amen. So here, it does not always run with the natural inclinations, nor does it spend itself only upon those for whom some closeness is discovered. In other words, I don't have to be close to you to love you. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught me to love my enemies. That is not a natural inclination. You don't just love people that are against you, that speak ill of you. And yet Jesus taught us to love them. Amen. To, to reach toward them. That's that agape love. So love lasts. Romance doesn't. It lasts. Love does. It lasts, my friend. It, it, it will last because God is love. But romance does. Romance deals with fantasy rather than reality. Romance is about gourmet restaurants and the candles just right and the flowers and the chocolates and all those things are set up with, with, with the mariachi band playing in the background. And everything falling in place at that moment and inside your head. Romance deals with settings, the weather, your mood, expectations. It depends on everything but commitment. Love, on the other hand, depends on nothing but commitment. You can have love at Dairy Queen. Mm, come on, Jesus. Amen. Romance cannot handle the demands of real life. It won't work. Amen. It's going to fade very quickly. You know, you, you can look for Ken and Barbie until the weight of each other, it will weigh you down with unrealistic expectations. Beauty is a billion-dollar business. And though Ken and Barbie are both perfect, they're perfectly plastic. Come on. And a lot of folk, you know, we're trying to keep the beauty and keep the figure and all this other stuff. Listen, when you love one another, that, you're going to get ready for the wrinkles. You get ready for the trouble. You get ready for the things that take place in life, amen, because you love each other. So what we do for each other before marriage, hear me, is no indication of what, we, what will happen after marriage. I'm sorry. I, don't, I, don't, I know it sounds bad, but some folks think before I got married, it was wonderful. Then I got married. Then I've said this for many years. Love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. Before marriage, we're carried away by the force of the in-love obsession. We fell in love. Most enter the marriage by the way of in love. We are in love. We meet someone whose physical characteristics and personality traits create enough electrical shocks inside of us to trigger the love alert system. The bells go off and we set in motion the process of getting to know the person. Hours and hours on the phone, texts and emails. We share a burger or whatever is in your budget. We are all on our quest to discover love. Amen. Could this warm, tingly feeling I have inside be the real thing? Then the tingle leaves on the second date when she cleans out her ears with your car keys. <laughs> you know, when love is reciprocated, we start talking about marriage because everyone agrees that being in love is the necessary foundation for a good marriage. We're high on love. And at its peak, it's an euphoric experience. It's amazing what it does. I mean, don't look around, but you remember. 
We're emotionally obsessed with each other. We eat, sleep, think about the other person. We long to be, to be together. When we hold hands, our blood flows together. Amen. It's, and I could say more, but I won't. After marriage, we often revert to being the people we were before we fell in love. Sorry. But that's just how it works. So there has to be some honest look at it. Our actions are influenced by the models of our parents, our personality, perceptions of love, our emotions, needs, and desires. And then the bottom falls out. Yeah, it, it happens. And eventually, you'll descend from the clouds and our feet touch the earth. Our eyes are open and we see the warts. We see the troubles. We recognize some irritating personality traits. They squeeze the toothpaste from the middle. The toilet paper is underneath instead of over the top. What is these strange things hanging over the bathroom, shower, curtain? I've never seen anything like that before. He leaves his stuff laying all over the floor. You didn't know he would do that. Things start happening around the house that seem strange. When you were by yourself, it didn't bother you. But now, this bothers me. What is he doing? Drinking that milk straight out of the carton. Didn't his mother teach him better? And then you mess up and say, my mom never cooked meatloaf like this. And then she hits you with the leftovers saying, I ain't your mama. <laughs> it bottoms out. We pray again, Cupid, draw back your bow. <laughs> Just one more time. Amen. It's time to stop pressure. It's time to stop it. You know, when I, I've heard people say this thing, when you get married, or you, or you, you get pretty old, still be single, aren't you? Uh, these are embarrassing. They're not necessary. You know, I, I was blessed in, in hiring... Pastor David and his sister Tony, you know, became married. But Joseph, he came single. And Josiah, he came single. And, and then they found their spouses through the house here, you know, in the, the kingdom of God. But I never wanted to see pressure on them because people put pressure on people. I have, I have a single 30-year-old son. I don't put no pressure on him. Amen. He almost got married once. Thank God prayed him out of it. Uh, <laughs> it's what parents do. Can I get an Amen. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said this, not everyone can accept this word. Not everybody can handle what I'm going to tell you, but only those to whom it has been given. For some are eunuchs because they were born that way. Others were made that way by men. A eunuch is someone who had their reproductive organs removed so there would be no problem in the kingdom in which they served. And Jesus, some men can't produce. And others were made that way by other men. And others have renounced marriage because of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. You know, in other words, Jesus wasn't de defending those who'd done it. He just said, this is the way it is. Some folk are born this way. Some folk were made this way. The bottom line is, some folk decided because of the kingdom of God, I'm going to stay single. Paul said it this way. If you want T-R-O-U-B-L-E, get married. That's what he said. Many of us, we, have, we don't even listen to the Bible until after we get married. Then we go, what the word say? Too late now, sucker. <laughs> Amen. Gotcha. So you got to learn to walk with your feet on the ground and your eyes on the Lord. If you're attracted to somebody, talk to your father before you talk to your buddy. Amen. Remember, love can wait. Romance will never stand the test that love can. So what does love do? Love seeks the welfare of others. Romans chapter 5. We who are strong ought to bear with the failing, the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good. We build uh, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. This is real love. Learning how to handle and love your neighbor no matter what. Love works no ill to any. Romans 13. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love to one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. What do we owe each other? Love. That's all we owe each other is to love one another. My debt to you is love. It's to continue loving you. Love seeks opportunity to do good to all men. Galatians 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the house of God. Amen. The family of God. The challenge of love is, is simply this. Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than these? And what he's speaking about is something that Peter actually loved. Let me tell you, God knows what you actually love, what possesses you, what you think about all the time. And the question he's going to ask you is simply this. Do you love me more than that? Whatever that is. 
I've said to you many times that a man with no future reverts back to his past. This is where that thought comes from. John chapter 21, Peter said after the resurrection of Jesus, it looks like it's over. He's dead. He's been in the tomb. He resurrected, but I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm going fishing. I'm going to go back to the way I was. You remember in the book of Luke, amen, and I think it's chapter 4, somewhere in that area, it's, uh, chapter 5, he said to Peter, from now I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now Peter has gone back fishing. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we're going to go with you, the rest of the disciples. So they went out and they got in a boat, but that night they caught nothing. There is nothing sadder than a fisherman who fishes all night to catch his nothing. If I fish all night and catch nothing, that's okay, I'm not a fisherman. But if you're a fisherman, that's what you're good at, and you don't catch anything, that's a hard night. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was him. He called out to them, friends, haven't you got any fish? Never, never ask a fisherman, have you caught anything? If he's a fisherman, he already going to tell you. Amen. You'll see a picture of it somehow. They're going to share. But so he asked, friends, don't you have any fish? No, they answered. And Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. When the disciple whom Jesus loved, I wonder who that was, John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped in the water. Now, let me back up a minute here. In Mobile, Alabama, and you can look it up on your phone. In Mobile, Alabama, they have a day of Jubilee. Jubilee is when everybody has been forgiven, your debts, it's a day of restoration. And in Mobile, Alabama, there's a time in the summertime where the water, something happens in the water. And the fish begin to come to shore. And, and the crabs come to shore. And the flounders come to shore. And the shrimp come to shore. And on that day, you don't have to have a license. All you got to do is get a basket, a bucket, run down there with your children and start picking them fish up right out of the water H, and throw them into your You can get as many as you can carry to get it home. And they call it Jubilee. It's a day of freedom. It's a day of release. It's a day of restoration. It's one of those great days of a great catch. Look it up. You can Google it. All right? It's Jubilee, man. It's an exciting time of life. The Israelites always celebrated Jubilee, and so do they in southern Alabama. Amen. They celebrate that day when they're going to get this great catch. It's one of the miraculous times. It happens every year when it comes in. Now, watch this. Don't Google right now. Wait on me. I'm going to tell you the T-R-U-T-H. Here at this moment, it was a jubilee moment. Those disciples had gone all night. They hadn't slept. They'd been in that boat. Jesus is gone. The world has ended. They've gone back. To, and many of us in our minds, we do the same thing. We just go right back to where we came from. All right, the world, it's over with, man. Had a really good little revival in my life. Things were well for a little while. And then you hear his voice. It could come through in a supermarket. It could come through at a rodeo. It could come through anywhere. But you hear his voice. And all of a sudden, he starts calling you back in. Friend, have you got any fish? Cast your net on the right side. That's what he said the last time we were fishing. They throw the net on the right side, and the net begins to fill up. And it didn't break. The Bible's important about it. It didn't even break. They even counted the fish as 153 fish. Amen. And at that moment, Peter, and it's that strange moment, he puts his clothes back on to jump out of the boat. You got to ask yourself, what was he thinking? If not, I'm going to walk on the water again. Because I'm going to tell you right now, before I jump in the water, I take my coat off. I don't put it on. But he took it, put his on, and starts to go out of the water. Next thing you know, he sinks. Now, the Bible says 100 yards. I don't know how many in this church can swim 100 yards in the ocean. But 100 yards is a good little stretch. And so he's got to go a football field across the water. But the excitement, his heart is pounding. His Lord is on the shore. His Lord is there. He, he's got a fire going. He's got fish at the fire, and he just told us how to catch fish again. Amen. There's an exciting moment of koinonia there, of fellowship, of, of coming back together. And so when he gets to the shore, the Scripture says, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. So they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards. And then they landed. They saw a fire burning coals there with fish on it. 
Jesus already been fishing. Amen. He, uh, we fished all night, caught nothing. He got fish. Not only got fish, he got bread. Amen. Where did he get the fish and bread? I don't know. He said he the bread of heaven. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard, dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come here and have some breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? He knew. It was him. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Fellowship. Communion. Breaking of bread. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, his name is Peter, you know that. Do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know I love you. Now, let me just break this down for you. When you're reading this in the English, you've got one word, love. When you're reading this in the Greek, how it was written, it says this. Do you agape me? Agape is sacrificial love. It has nothing to do with your feelings. It has to do with the one you love. Amen. That you would sacrifice for them. You would do something for them. It, 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 it doesn't matter the price. You just love them like that. It's sacrifice. The word filio, which is the word friendship, is what Peter answered. We hear the word Philadelphia. It's the city of brotherly love. Amen. As of tonight, there'll be the world champions in football. Amen. So, so philia, Philadelphia. So here at this moment, we, we read in this that Jesus said, do you agape me more than these? <laughs> yes, Lord, he said. You know that I filio you. You're my friend. You're my friend. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon Peter, son uh, of, of John, do you love me? Do you uh, sacrifice for me? Will you Agape me, and he said, yes, Lord, you know that I'm your friend. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon Peter, son of John, do you agape me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. He says, you know that I am your friend. He said, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. See, he's trying to set Peter up to remind him of what's fixing to happen to him. You know, you think you're going to go back fishing, but that's not going to be that way. You're going to be a fisherman. And I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Now, I got to close here, but I want, to hear, I want you to hear me. He prophesied. A word to Peter that when you're old, you're going to die. They're going to lead you where you don't want to go. Now, old to them was about 50. Right. All right, so I'm, I've done passed it by 12 years, but that's, that's old, about 50. So he said, Peter, when, they, when you get older, you're going to die. So we figure that Peter's in his early 20s are here right now. He's a young, young man. And so he's hearing this word from Jesus that when he's old, he's going to leave. Now, that matters because you get in the book of Acts, we find Peter in jail knowing that the next day they're going to uh, eliminate his head. They're going to take it off. And the Bible says that an angel went there and woke him up, opened the jail cell, and he walked out, amen, free with all the soldiers around him. Why does that why does it hit you? Because he was sleeping. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you're in jail and you know the next day you're going to die, are you going to be sleeping? No, you're going to be praying in tongues all night. <laughs> Amen. You're going to be getting hold of the Holy Ghost. You're going to be, you're going to be crying out to God. Amen. Because you ain't got a few hours left. Peter's sleeping. The angel has to wake him up. Amen. And they walk toward the door, and the door is open automatically. Amen. Just like Walmart. Whoop, whoop, right open. And he walks right on out. Amen. The soldiers are all asleep, and he gets free. Reason I say that is because this word was so pertinent to Peter that he knew that Jesus didn't lie. And Jesus said, when I get old, they're going to leave me where. And I ain't old yet. So whatever happens in my life, you can't stone me and kill me. You can't beat me and kill me. None of this is going to happen until God is ready to take me home. This is important in your life because you've got to make up your mind, what did God say to you? Amen. How's it? Because I will not leave this planet until God is done with me. And when I'm gone, I'm gone. But as far as I understand and believe the Word of God, I'm staying here until He's done with me. Yeah. Amen. Can you hear me? Yeah. So here's Peter having this moment. Do you, do you agape me? Or you say, and hear me. I appreciate Jesus not beating him up with the Word. 
And say, hold on, I said to you, no, Peter said, I'm your friend, Jesus. I know you're my friend, but will you agape, will you sacrifice for me? Well, I'm your friend, Jesus. I'll take care of the sheep. I'll take care of the lambs. I'll take care as they grow. The bottom line in our lives are we progress in life. We get better. Don't beat yourself up because you're not the most sacrificial person that loves God right now. But give yourself a year, maybe two years, and I believe by then you'll be sacrificial. But in our lives, as we grow in God, there are times I can, the best I can tell you, Jesus, I'm your friend. And I am thankful just to be your friend. But one day I'd like to tell you that I want to be closer than that. And when Peter went out on the day of Pentecost and he preached and 3,000 was added and 5,000 was added, when he stood boldly before the Sanhedrin, when he prophesied and talked about Jesus' death on the cross and what they had done, all that boldness came because of the word of God in him. And God speaks to us on Sunday mornings and through the week. And he begins to share in our hearts what real love is. Man, when I got born again, it was romance. Woo, it was romance. I mean, seriously, my foul mouth quit almost automatically. The chasing of young girls was over. Drinking, I, I quit drinking. Right? I mean, I, I quit drinking November the 10th, 1979. When's the last time you drank, Pastor? November the 9th. And it was romance. I mean, romance. I would pray over something, and God would take the warts off my fingers and take them off my toes. Honest to God. I saw a miracle after me. I needed a job. I agreed in Jesus' name. The next day, RC Cola calls and says, Come on in to work. I left burger flipping for delivering RCs. It was an amazing, for me, it was a miracle because there were no jobs in North Alabama. I saw God do miracle after miracle in the lives of my friends. It was romantic. It was exuberant. It was exciting. And then after a few months, a year, two years, I found myself learning how to live by faith. I didn't feel it no more. I'd go to church. I'd watch people jumping up and down. And getting all excited, running around the church. I'm going, I don't feel nothing. I don't feel anything. Where did the romance go? And God would remind me, it's not about romance, son. It's about agape. Even when you don't feel it, I'm there. When you don't hear me, I'm talking. Amen. When you don't see it, there's still vision. you got to get up and keep going. And then it'll hit you again. And you'll feel it. And you'll be the one running. And you'll be excited. And you'll be thrilled that the youth group's growing. Amen. The children's church is listening. The adults are coming into the house and getting born again. They're still that excited. But you've got to live by faith. Marriage is the same way. You don't always feel in love with that dude. It's faith. It's covenant. I just got to believe it. Jesus said, do you truly love me more than these? It's not always romantic to follow Jesus. Probably speaking of the fish, what are these in your life? You know, sometimes you can love religion more than you can God. You can love your religion, your denomination, something that you're connected to. I want to love him. Do you love me more than these, your occupation? It's all about my job, your vehicles, your houses, relations. Do you love me more than these? See, this is true lordship. To love him more. Jesus kept asking for agape. But Peter kept getting, giving him friend. Romance may get you started. Romance to me is miracles. I'll watch people chase miracles. They'll hear that there's a, a local preacher down the road somewhere. And they'll run to get the miracle. Get somebody to blow on them. Slap them on the forehead. I was, I was involved in all that for years. But I found out a lot of that was just romance. They'll run after that. But after a while, and I'm not slamming anybody for doing it. I'm just saying that's romance. But commitment must keep us going. True commitment. Verse 19, Jesus finishes with these two words. Follow me. Follow me. It led to an upside-down cross. But he had literally started a New Testament movement. The preaching of the Word of God. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Follow me. I don't want to ruin your Valentine's Day. I'm just here to tell you that that ain't all there is. 
he changed the definition of love for me. And I'm to go from friendship with him to sacrificial love. He called us all to feed the sheep and the little ones. Hallelujah. I got a minute here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As a romance wore off from serving God, you were excited at one time, and now it's just its kind of a fleeting memory of what it was like. Now God's calling you. It's time for you to start living by faith. It's time for you when you don't feel it that you get up and keep going. When it feels like the ceilings are brass, you keep praying. When you haven't seen a miracle in years, you keep believing. When it seems like that spouse of yours is never going to change, you keep holding on to God for it, believing for the best in their life. Yes, sir, Pastor, that's me. Just put your hand up right now and hold it there. Just hold it there. Hold it there. Hold it there. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, on this day, I choose to live by faith. On this day, I'm going to serve you and love you no matter the cost. Bring me into a place that sacrifice is no big deal. Help me to be excited about fellowship with my brothers and sisters, for those will be the ones that I spend eternity with. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, bless the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. He changed the definition. He shifted it around in my life. Amen. I thought it was one way, and I'm going to tell you, if more couples understood, if more people, individuals understood the real definition of love, it's about sacrifice. You know, I, again, today, I'm, I'm going to go get my son's vehicle. That's just sacrifice. What D and HD did for her mom, sacrifice. And I'll tell you this, I'll do that for just about anybody. Amen. I just... You, when you love people, you just sacrifice. Amen. You believe God for it because that's, that's the real definition of love. Well, what if you don't get anything back? It has nothing to do with that. Amen. It has nothing to do with that. Amen. Just prepare for that. If you need to tie their offering envelope, it's in front of you. Our servant leaders will be coming up here to help us out. Amen. Let me tell you about your faithfulness in giving. Pastor Joseph had 47 people in youth service Wednesday night. <laughs> 47. And the growth of our youth group means this. As the students and the ministry starts growing, we need more finances to help. So I'm, I'm encouraging your tithe and your offering because we've been putting money into the youth and doing things for them. That's got to continue. So sometimes you don't realize what you're sowing into. But, you know, we got, you know, it's like when we help the kids go see the ark in Kentucky. We got to keep our youth growing. Hey, Amen. We got camp starting. Is it this week? Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So, sir? Yeah, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we got camp out at the ranch. I want to invite you men to come out and have me, uh, breakfast with me Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. Saturday morning out at the ranch, 8 o'clock. So you, anytime you have camp, they're already having breakfast, so we just have breakfast with them. Right, Jennifer? Amen. It just saves from having to turn it all on again. Plus, we've got to prepare for our beast feast. So, uh, men, love to have you out. How many men think you can come to church Sat, I mean, uh, camp next week, Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. Are you men in here? Saturday, 8 o'clock? Amen. Because you mean something to those men to gather out there with them and to connect with them. Amen. As we give today, we'll be leaving God for? God. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission. Gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Pastor David. Give it up for your pastor. Again, it was his birthday on Wednesday, so we do celebrate our pastor. We love our pastor. Continue to bless your pastor. Let him know what he means to you. Facebook, gifts, surprises in the mail. Make all those things happen for him. You know, the truth is, you guys are blessed. We are blessed to be able to call him pastor for the vision that he has for the house, for the vision that he has for our communities. That's what's important. 
It's not about, oh, yay, he does a good job on Sunday. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. His job is, this is a very small part of his job. His job is through the week. This is just the, the cherry, the proverbial peak of the iceberg. Uh, your pastor does a lot for you guys that you just will never see. And that's a good thing because you don't need to see it. It's good that he's able to do that stuff and not require you to be there with every step that he's doing stuff. So bless your pastor. He is taking off today. That's a pretty long drive. He is going to be picking up a car on the trailer. So bless the wheels and all the tires. But let everything just stay good. And bless the bearings because Lord knows you get a bearing or something crazy, that's a terrible time on the road. But uh, just continue to pray for your pastor. Pray for Joseph. Pray for Josiah, myself. Like Things come up through the weeks because we're praying for you. If nothing else, we're praying for you. Pastor talking about love this morning, man. I, I was thinking about it. I said, man, I can, I can sum up love with two four-letter words. T-I-M-E and W-O-R-K. Those are the two words right there. I promise you. That's what he's talking about. Sustainability. Listen, don't spend some time with somebody. See how long that lasts. Not going to happen. <laughs> Not going to happen, right? Don't work at it. See what happens. You try to grow a tree. Never spend time with it. Never water it. Never do nothing with it. And expect it to give you fruit. Good luck. It's not going to happen, right? So in our relationships, W-O-R-K and T-I-M-E. That's the two most valuable things that I think I get to do with my kids and my wife. Because that's what I realize, man. Those are the things that make a difference in their lives. And it makes a difference in my life. Because it's making a difference in their life. Again, February 12th, swap seniors with the... With a purpose.